Well, please open your Bibles to the end of the Gospel of Luke. I'll be focusing on Luke 23, verses 39 to 43. The title for the message this morning is simply, The Criminals on the Cross. And depending on how well you know which stories appear in which Gospels, you may or may not know that Luke is the only one to record the words of the thief on the cross. And I found it interesting that Luke never actually calls him a thief. The two men are referred to more generally as criminals in this passage. It is Matthew and Mark where they are called not thieves, but robbers. And if you remember Stan making the distinction between these two terms, the word for robber has the connotation of stealing by force, by violence, or by threat of violence. So in the future, when you think about the thief on the cross, it may be helpful to remember that he didn't simply steal some food because he was hungry, and so they crucified him, but rather this guy actually hurt people and maybe even killed people. Some think that he may have been a companion of Barabbas and was part of the insurrection murder. And that's why these guys are being crucified along with Jesus. However, for the purposes of today's message, Luke refers to the men as criminals, thus my title, The Criminals on the Cross. So let's begin by reading this passage from Luke 23, and to get the context, we'll go ahead and start with verse 32 and read through 43. Two others also who were criminals were being led away to be put to death with him, that is Jesus. When they came to the place called the Skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right and the other on the left. But Jesus was saying, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots, dividing up his garments among themselves. And the people stood by, looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the, the king of the Jews, save yourself. Now there was also an inscription above him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Well, why don't we seek the Lord's help now as we look into this passage together. Father, as we come before your word, our desire is to understand it rightly, to know what you've said to us, our desire is that this would change our lives, the way we think, the way we live, the way we speak to those around us. And we pray that these desires would be fulfilled this morning. And again, that we would come away changed because of what we've seen in your word. I pray that you'd help the message this morning to be clear and help each of those listening to be able to pay attention, that there not be distractions, that Christ would be honored this morning. 
that your people would be built up. And it is in the name of your Son we pray. Amen. Well, my intention this morning is to begin at verse 39, explaining the passage, and then to give a few points of application. So verse 39 begins with one of the criminals. We know from verse 32 that there were specifically two other criminals besides Jesus being led away to be put to death. And verse 33 makes clear that Jesus was crucified between these two men, one on the right and the other on the left. So that image you've had in your mind for as long as you can remember of the three crosses with Jesus hanging on the cross in the middle is indeed correct. Now, I bring that up because it's very easy for some of these well-known stories to take on details that were never recorded in Scripture. I mean, just think about the fact that there are songs about the three kings who brought gifts to baby Jesus. I mean, isn't that what the nativity scenes are, are d depicting most of the time? However, Scripture does not reveal how many men there were who brought gifts to Jesus. We don't know that it was three. And it doesn't say that Jesus was a baby. In fact, he may have been as old as two years old, as old as Jace. Um, but returning to the passage before us, again, it is clear Jesus was crucified between the two criminals. Now, if you want to know which criminal spoke first, the one on the right or the one on the left, you won't find that in the Bible. Luke is the only one to record the words of these men, and he doesn't provide that detail. Well, let's look at the words of this first criminal and see what we can learn from it. Verse 39, one of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. For the longest time I read this verse in a particular way, I imagined a very bitter man dying in agony on the cross who doesn't really believe that Jesus is the Christ, but he's saying, if by chance you happen to be the Christ, don't just hang there doing nothing, save yourself. And you know what? While you're at it, why don't you save us too? I'd like to get down from this cross. I don't want to die here. Do something. That's the way I viewed this man's words before. But then I saw something when I was preparing this message, something that really changed my mind, and it's the way that Luke describes his words. New American Standard says, he was hurling abuse at Jesus, saying what he said, literally blaspheming him. I believe the ESV says that he railed at him. And I realized that that didn't really fit my perception of the way this guy was speaking to Jesus. And so I went back to the text to see how could I understand this more correctly. And the context made it obvious. Look back at verse 35, and we'll see what some of these others were saying to Jesus. Verse 35, And the people stood by looking on, and even the rulers were sneering at him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if this is the Christ of God, his chosen one. Verse 36, the soldiers also mocked him, coming up to him, offering him sour wine and saying, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. And we read in Matthew and Mark about others who were passing by, hurling abuse and wagging their heads, saying the same types of things as everyone else. So this criminal hanging on the cross next to Jesus sees all these people coming up, mocking and insulting Jesus, and he just joins right in with all the mocking. You can imagine him with a smirk on his face, looking over at Jesus as he hears everybody else making fun of him and saying, you know, hey, hey, aren't you the Christ? Hey, why don't you save yourself? Maybe you can save us too. And he just mocks him this way. And verse 39 is the only words we have recorded of the first criminal, and we don't hear from him again after this. Now, verse 40 is the beginning of the words of the other criminal, the one we typically refer to as the thief on the cross. This man refers to, responds to what the first man said and rebukes him for it. 
Look at 40 and 41. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. Now obviously this man is quite different from the first, the first man. But he was not always so different. In fact, when he was first hanged on the cross, he was just like the first guy. And in a very short span of time, he changed and he was saying things like this. And how do we know that? Well, I want you to look over at Matthew's account. Go to Matthew chapter 27, and we're going to look just at verse 44. Matthew 27, verse 44. The robbers who had been crucified with him were also insulting him with the same words. This is more proof that they were just joining in with everyone else in the way they were mocking Jesus and insulting him. But note that it says the robbers, plural. Matthew says that both men were insulting Jesus. Now some have taken this different ways as far as trying to understand how in one account, it says that both robbers are doing it. In this account, we have one robber insulting while the other has, has changed. But I'm convinced that the best way to understand this is that early on on the cross, both men were insulting Jesus. But that during the time on the cross, one of those men came under deep conviction and ended up speaking the words that Luke records here. And so let me ask this, what was, what was it that the Holy Spirit used in this man's conversion? We'll just consider all that he's been witnessing. He watched Jesus respond with grace to all of the insults and mockery of which he was a part. If you look back at, verse, at uh, Luke 23, verse 34, he must have heard Jesus utter these words. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That must have cut deep. He had just been insulting and mocking Jesus with everyone else, and Jesus prays for them, demonstrating his love for them. Consider also if these men were led away with Jesus to Golgotha. Perhaps he heard Jesus speaking to the women in verses 28 through 31. Where, he's, where Jesus is saying, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Again, on the way to his death, Jesus is concerned about others, and perhaps this man witnessed that. Surely he observed the care that Jesus took of his mother as he entrusted her well-being to John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's something that happened on the cross. And perhaps he began to think about the inscription above Jesus, this is the king of the Jews, about all the insults, if you are the Christ, if you are the chosen one, if you are the son of God, he saved others. Perhaps the Holy Spirit changed all of that mocking into truth being proclaimed to him. Well, regardless of how many or how few of these things played a part in this man's conversion, it's astounding that he was transformed from a violent robber into a gentle child of God over the course of a few hours or less. Now, looking back at verse 40, let's think about what he says to the first man. Let's look at the, look, look at the question he begins with. Do you not even fear God? Now, I wanted to point out one particular word in his question that's easy to read over, but then I realized, for those of you reading the ESV, it's extremely easy to read over it because the word isn't even there. <laughs> it's the word even. Do you not even fear God? The ESV says, do you not fear God? Now I realize that in the end, there's not a great deal of difference between these two questions. Do you not fear God? 
do you not even fear God? But the distinction is made in the Greek, and I want you to appreciate the nuance to the question that he asks. So first let me make clear the distinction is in the Greek. The Greek word is ude. It's a compound word that's appropriately translated, not even. And you find it in such verses as, not even Solomon clothed himself like one of these. Or, not even in Israel have I found such faith. Or, does not even nature itself teach you that if a man has long hair, it's a dishonor to him. So this word even is rightly, it is rightly translated that way. Now one of the Greek commentators that I read suggested there were three possible understandings for how to read this. And it's basically just a difference on where you put the emphasis. And so these are the three ways you could read it. Number one, do you not even fear God? Even you? I know the Romans don't, but you? Or two, do you not even fear God? You may not fear the men who condemned you to die, but don't you fear God, even Him? Or the third way, and this is the way that this commentator felt was the most likely, the, the best way to understand it because of the positioning of the words in the Greek. Do you not even fear God? let alone have any higher feelings towards Him. I'm not asking if you love God or would lay down your life for Him. Do you even fear Him? We're talking about the bottom rung of the ladder here. Even demons fear God. You don't even do that? That's the kind of question that he's asking. And that's really all I wanted you to see about the nuance of this question. Again, it doesn't fundamentally change your understanding of the question, but that, that nuance is there. So what is it that prompted him to ask the question? What has transpired that has caused this man to conclude, you don't even fear God, do you? Well, I believe we get the answer by reading the remainder of verse 40 and into 41. So look back at that. Do you not even fear God? since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds, but this man has done nothing wrong. Albert Barnes paraphrases these verses in a way that really gets to the bottom of what this man is asking here and what he's accusing this man of and what he's warning him about here. So let me just read this from Albert Barnes. Dost not thou fear God? You are condemned to die as well as he. It is improper for you to rail on him as the rulers and Romans do. God is just, and you are hastening to his bar, and you should therefore fear him and fear that he will punish you for railing on this innocent man. So that's why he's asking the question, how can you be hurling abuse at him right now? You're dying just like he is. You deserve it. He doesn't. Don't you fear what God will do to you for railing at him in this way? Now, the only other things I would point out about verse 41 are these. Number one, take note of this criminal's confession. And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. He recognizes his guilt and that the punishment he's enduring is right. It's not easy for criminals to say such things. They may know it deep down, but they won't say it aloud. And the second thing, he came to see the innocence of Jesus. This man has done nothing wrong. Now, how would he know this? How would he come to that conclusion? Well, perhaps he was at the trial where Pilate repeatedly declared that Jesus was innocent. And now having witnessed his conduct on the way to the cross and in response to his persecutors, he has come to see the reality of that declaration of, in, of innocence. Well, let's look now at verse 42. Having finished rebuking the other criminal, he now turns to Jesus to say one thing and one thing alone. 
And he was saying to Jesus, or he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. Brethren, if you were in that man's place and could only make one request of the Lord, what would it be? This man's request, remember me. He could have asked, would you save me from this horrible death? I mean, in contrast to the first criminal, he actually believed that Jesus could do that. But that was no longer his concern. He simply wanted Jesus to remember him. And it's amazing what this man's one request tells us about his newfound faith. Number one, he believes that Jesus really is a king. Remember me when you come in your kingdom. Two, he believes that Jesus will rise again. I mean, just imagine the scene. He's watching Jesus dying right in front of him. He says, remember me when you come. If someone had said to him right then, what are you, an idiot? He's about to die right in front of you. How's he going to come and save you? His response would have been, minor setback. He'll be alive again in three days. Isn't that what you guys were just uh, making fun of him for? Uh, destroy this temple and I will raise it up in three days. He was talking about his body. He'll be alive again in three days. And when he comes, I want him to remember me. And he believes that, the third thing, he believes that he himself will rise again. He knows that he's not passing out of existence, that he's, go, he's not, that he's going to sleep in Christ, and that one day he will be resurrected. And when that day comes, he wants Jesus to remember him. And now we come to the final verse of this passage. It's here that we read how Jesus responds to this criminal's request. Verse 43. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you shall be with me in paradise. Now this is one passage among others that teach that when Christians die, they pass immediately into the presence of God. But I had a roommate in medical school who was a Seventh-day Adventist, and he believed that Christians don't pass into the presence of God immediately upon death, but they go into a sleep-like state, and they're unconscious until the resurrection, and then at that time, they'll go to be with God. Now, he and I were having a somewhat heated discussion one day on this subject, and this verse here was one of the main verses I was trying to use to show, no, see, he says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And my roommate said to me, Oh, didn't you know that's a punctuation error? It should read, Truly I say to you today, comma, you shall be with me in paradise. That I'm telling you right now, today, I'm telling you that someday in the future you'll be with me in paradise. And at the time of our discussion, I didn't really know how to respond to that. How, what, what could I argue to say, no, that's the wrong way to take this? But I thought about it a lot afterwards, and the first thing I did was I did a search of the New American Standard Bible for the phrase, truly I say to you. I wanted to see how many times is that in Scripture. And so in the four Gospels, you have 76 instances of Jesus saying, truly I say to you. And then I did a search for, truly I say to you today. I want to see how many times is that in Scripture. How many times did he say that? Was that a phrase he said? This is the only time he says it. <laughs> the, it's not a phrase. Every single time he says, truly I say to you, he follows it by what he wants to say to you. And so in this case it is, today you shall be with me in paradise. The other thing that I've since noticed about this passage that really confirms he's telling him, today you'll be with me in paradise, is the time element of their conversation. Look at the request of the man. Jesus, remember me when you come in your kingdom. He's specific. He could have just said, Jesus, remember me. But he specifically says, remember me when. Like, I know someday you're going to come back in your kingdom. And when that time comes, remember me then. And Jesus responds to it, today. 
<laughs> you don't have to wait until then, till later on. Today you will be with me in paradise. Well, what else can we learn from this verse? Consider what Jesus promised him. He didn't just say, today you'll be in paradise. He said, today you shall be with me in paradise. That's what matters. Not being in paradise, but being with Jesus. And that's exactly what this man wanted to hear. He wanted Jesus to remember him personally. And Jesus said, I will. You'll be with me in paradise. Well, one final point of explanation before I get to some application. I want to briefly mention this word, paradise. Because I find it interesting that Jesus did not say, Today you shall be with me in heaven. I mean, it's not like Luke didn't use the word heaven in his gospel. The Greek word for heaven is used 35 times in Luke. Now, it's not always used for the heavenly realm. He does talk about rain from heaven, from, you know, from the sky or the birds of the air, literally birds of heaven. But you do have several phrases like, you'll have treasure in heaven, and your names are written in heaven. So you might expect him to say here, today you shall be with me in heaven. But he chooses the word paradise. So it should at least make you stop and ask, is Jesus referring to something other than heaven here when he says, today you shall be with me in paradise? Now, I don't have any desire to go into an extensive word study this morning, but it is simple enough to look at the two and only two other instances of this word paradise found in the New Testament and see if we can learn anything from it. So I want you to turn to Revelation chapter 2, where we see one of these two other instances. Revelation chapter 2, this is the letter to the church at Ephesus. And we're going to look at verse 7. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And John talks more about the tree of life later on in this letter. In chapter 22, he speaks more about the tree of life. And honestly, my, my reading of it, I I don't see that this place where the tree of life is is anything other than heaven, where I am hoping to go one day. And so from this instance of the word paradise, I don't see any other reason to take it as a different place than, than heaven. Now, the, th the third and final use of this word paradise is found in 2 Corinthians. So I'll have you turn there. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. This is where Paul's talking about these revelations that, that he's had, visions and revelations. And so we'll look at verses 2 through 12. So 2 Corinthians 12, 2 through 4, sorry, 2 through 4. I know a man in Christ, and he's speaking of himself here, I know a man in, in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body, I do not know, or out of the body, I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know how such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words. And basically, all I want to show you there is that he seems to use these words caught up to the third heaven and caught up into paradise. I mean, he seems to use them interchangeably. Now, there are some commentators who will take this in a different way and 
they have all kinds of things of like, well, the third heaven was this place, and then paradise was a thing even beyond that, and Paul was talking about two different instances here. But I never found any of those arguments very convincing. I, I felt like a more natural reading of this passage was this, he's speaking of the same thing, and then he just interchanges those, those words. And in case the phrase third heaven sounds kind of confusing, the, the best explanation that I saw for this is you have a concept of heaven, first heaven where like the clouds and the birds are, second heaven where the sun, moon, and stars are, and so the third heaven would be what's beyond that where God and the angels dwell. And so again, we're talking about heaven paradise is seeming to be used interchangeably with that. And so when it comes to the New Testament, I, I don't see any other reason to take it as some other place other than, than heaven itself. So that brings us to the end of my explanation of the passage. But we don't want to stop there. We're not satisfied with gaining knowledge of Scripture. We want to apply these things to our lives. And as a general rule, as you go about reading your Bible, you ought to be asking yourself questions that will help you apply what you're reading. And there are two questions in particular that are helpful to ask of this passage, and they are these. Is there an example for me to follow? Is there an error for me to avoid? The two criminals in this passage provide us with ready answers to those questions. It's quite obvious that we should not be like the first criminal who was hurling abuse at Jesus. And clearly, the thief on the cross who calls on Jesus is an ex excellent example for us to follow. But I don't want to merely make the basic statements, don't be like this guy, be like this guy. I want to elaborate. I want us to understand exactly what we should avoid, to perceive clearly what is worthy of imitation here. And so I have four things to mention by way of application. First of all, Make sure you're not living for this world, but have your eyes set on the world to come. Make sure you're not living for this world, but have your eyes set on the world to come. Now, in terms of this passage, all we need to do is contrast the words of these two criminals. The first man, if you're the Christ, save yourself and us. Now, like, I mean... If there was any kind of real request there, it was, save me now from this death. Whereas the other man said, remember me when you come in your kingdom. He was no longer concerned about, about this world, about this life. He had his eyes set on the world to come when Jesus would return in his kingdom. And brethren, isn't it easy to become consumed by the affairs of this world? to get so wrapped up in this life that we make this our home as if there was nothing else, as if this was all there was. There's a brief statement that a missionary from China once said, this world is not our home. We are only passing through. So make sure you're not living for this world, but have your eyes set on the world to come. The second thing, I'll make this statement and then I want to take some time to explain it. Faith looked forward then, back at this time uh, on the cross with Jesus. Faith looked forward then, it looks back now, and it's all that's required for salvation. You know, a question that perplexed me for a long time was how were people in the Old Testament saved? I understood that we are saved by believing that Jesus died and rose again, but if you lived before Jesus' death and resurrection, how could you be saved? It didn't happen yet. Now, some have tried to answer that by saying that the animal sacrifices took away sins, that the Old Testament saints were saved by animal sacrifices. However, the book of Hebrews makes very clear that it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So how were they saved? Well, Hebrews 11 makes a really helpful statement about these saints from the Old Testament. 
Hebrews 11.13 says, All these died in faith without receiving the promises, but having seen them and having welcomed them from a distance. That's a perfect picture. They had the promises of God. They saw them from a distance and they were welcoming them. And even though they died before they ever received those promises, that their faith was looking forward. And now our faith looks back to when Christ died and rose again. And it's the same for this thief on the cross as the Old Testament saints. Christ hadn't died yet. He was about to, but it hadn't happened yet. He was looking forward to it. He knew Christ was going to die. He knew he would rise again, and he was putting his trust in him. In faith, he called on Jesus to remember him. Well, my next point of application is directed toward those of you who do not yet know the Lord, who have yet to repent and turn to Christ, to those who are still hanging on to your sin. And this is what I would say. Don't delay repentance. Don't say to yourself, you know what? I'm going to live my life the way I want to live it. I'm not going to let God tell me what to do. And when I get to the end of my life, then I'll turn to God. Just like the thief on the cross, I'll just wait to the end and then I'll turn to God. Well, let me give you two reasons why you should not do that. First of all, that will be a miserable life. Just ask anyone here who tried to live that way. None of us would say, oh, I wish I could go back to those days when I was living it up, when I was sinning as much as I wanted to. None of us think that way. Sin is a brief pleasure followed by constant boredom and agony and misery. And all you do is just look forward to the next time you get to sin and if you don't get a chance to sin you're just miserable why would you want to live like that now maybe you don't believe me maybe you think what I'm saying doesn't make any sense well let me give you another reason not to live like this not to delay repentance until the end many people die suddenly and they don't get a chance to repent at the end of their life but even if you do there's no guarantee you will repent. You don't know what you'll be like when that time comes. You may be so hardened by your life of sin that you absolutely refuse to repent. Or maybe you won't even think about it. I mean, look at this passage. How many criminals were on the cross with Jesus? There were two. And only one of them repented. These guys heard the same, they lived the same kind of life. They saw the same things, they heard the same things at the end of their life, and only one of them repented. The other guy didn't. You don't know which one you're going to be like. So don't delay repentance. You have today to repent. That's all you're guaranteed. Don't delay. Today is the day of salvation. Well, my final point of application is this. Think much about being with Jesus, about being with Him. The focus of the request from the thief on the cross, remember me when you come, a very personal request, a relational request. And the emphasis of Jesus' response, you will be with me. So my final exhortation to you this morning is to think much about being with Jesus. The Apostle Paul, did, said he desired to depart and be with Christ. Jesus said, I want them to be with me where I am. That day is coming, brethren. You will stand next to Jesus. You will wrap your arms around him and never let go. You will finally be with someone who knows you better than your own family, better than your closest friend, better than your husband or your wife. This is the one who loved you with a love that surpasses knowledge. Could we with ink the ocean fill, and were the skies of parchment made, were every stalk on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade? To write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry, nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky to sky. This is the one you'll be with. Think much 
about being with Jesus. Well, that's all that I had to share with you guys this morning. I wanted to close with one song that I felt gets at the at what I was saying there at the end, and it's um, 156 in the songbook. Jesus who died for